Great. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the opportunity, and thank you, everyone, for coming out so early in the morning. This is the outline of what we're going to discuss this morning is uh, quality of life in pediatric patients with IBD, what causes poor quality of life, uh, how we can assess it, and I'll end up with a little bit about uh, improving quality of life. So first of all, some background. Uh, despite the availability of more effective therapies and people and the more wide use of more effective therapies, about 40% of patients continue to have active symptoms even when their disease appears to be in remission. These are active symptoms that reduce their quality of life. Uh, this pediatric data and adult data. This is a large study from across Europe that looked at quality of life. This is uh, across all IBD patients. And the y-axis is an assessment of the proportion of patients who have good quality of life. The light colored short bars here represent uh, the quality of life assessment at the time of diagnosis and the taller, darker bars represent quality of life after about a year, regardless of therapy. <clears throat> Excuse me. And you can see, of course, at, at diagnosis, there are many people who have poor quality of life. But even after a year, it's uh, somewhere between 20 and 30 percent, thank you, who uh, continue to have poor quality of life. Now, there are lots of reasons for this. The first and important reason f that we pay the most attention to is active disease. And as we all see, the more active the disease, the, the, the worse patients feel, and that translates to worse quality of life. The graph on the top here is an adult study, and what's on the y-axis, VAS is the visual analog scale, and I'll talk about measures in a little bit. But the, the sort of speckled line going across the horizontal is the population mean for normal, healthy people. Uh, so that's kind of a set, a normal quality of life. And if you look, as disease gets worse across the excess axis, uh, understandably quality of life goes down. Uh, the graph on the bottom here is a study that we did uh, surveying college students across the country. Uh, and as their disease activity gets worse, again, their quality of life goes down. So it's no surprise. This is what we're most familiar with. But there are many other things that can contribute to quality of, poor quality of life, fatigue, pain, many other symptoms that patients experience, and then depression, anxiety, embarrassment, social stigma, family dynamics, stress, there are many other contributors to poor quality of life. So I'm going to go through these one at a time. <clears throat> Excuse me. The, so fatigue. Fatigue is a very common symptom in IBD. Uh, depending on what study you look, like, look at, anywhere from 30 to over 80 percent of people with IBD have uh, fatigue as one of their complaints. And even when patients are in remission, by the way we measure remission, fatigue persists in 40 to 50 percent of patients. And fatigue is pro strongly, <coughs> excuse me, fatigue is strongly associated with poor quality of life. Um, this graph on the bottom here is from a study by uh, Seth Marcus and Jens Robel. Uh, the y-axis here is just the percent of the measure. So the, the group of uh, bars on the left is the, uh, the PEDS QL, uh, which I'll also talk about more later, the Pediatric Generic Quality of Life Index. And on the right is, is fatigue. And this compares healthy controls, which are the blue bars, to I pediatric IBD patients, the red bars, and pediatric cancer patients, the green bars. And you can see, of course, um, Quality of life is lower in IBD patients and healthy controls, but the fatigue level is, is strikingly high. The fatigue level in uh, pediatric IBD patients is close to that of pediatric cancer patients. Now, abdominal pain is something we see all the time in our practices, and 50 to 70 percent of pediatric IBD patients um, have abdominal pain when they have active disease. But, but Depending on the study, 20 to 50 percent of patients continue to have, act, have abdominal pain even when their disease is in remission. And this can happen for many reasons. It can happen because of mechanical reasons, such as strictures, adhesions, partial small, small bowel obstruction, and extraintestinal reasons, such as stones. It can also happen because there's occult inflammation, inflammation that we are not uh, recognizing, gastritis, uh, ongoing enteritis, uh, as well as more dramatic uh, uh, sources of inflammation, such as abscesses and fistulas. And then there are many other reasons for pain, narcotic bowel syndrome, irritable bowel syndrome, functional abdominal pain, depression, anxiety. There's a whole range of reasons why patients experience abdominal pain. Speaking of irritable bowel syndrome, this is very common. Uh, in adult studies, 26 to 57 percent of adults with IBD also have concomitant IBS. There's not very much pediatric data on this, uh, no population-based uh, uh, studies. There's a, uh, one study um, 
uh, by Lori Zimmerman and, the, and colleagues that looked at this in a cohort of 300 children with Crohn's disease. Um, and they found that 45% of those patients have abdominal pain. And of those, 18 patients, or 13%, <coughs> excuse me, excuse me, or 13% of the patients with abdominal pain have what was classified as functional abdominal pain. Now, irritable bowel syndrome, as I was saying, is common in patients with IBD, but it's important to recognize that what we think is IBS in somebody who we think is in remission might actually represent occult inflammation. Uh, this was a, a study of IBD patients who were in remission by a physician global assessment, and of the Crohn's patients in remission, 60% of them were felt to have irritable, or met criteria for irritable bowel syndrome, and 40% of the UC patients met criteria for IBS. But importantly, and this was what this study looked at, is the calprotectin level was higher in patients who were in remission and thought to have IBS. So this graph, uh, the, 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 the y-axis is uh, calprotectin. This is at average across the patients in the group. And on the x-axis, the black bars, the tall bar, is Crohn's disease plus irritable bowel syndrome. The gray bar is Crohn's plus, or without IBS and then controls. And there was a similar graph for UC showing that there is inflammation in at least some of our patients that appear to be in remission with IBS. So we should always consider this to be a possibility. Depression is another common reason for poor quality of life. And in that same study um, by Laurie Zimmerman, uh, 300 patients with Crohn's, the same one, 45% of them had abdominal pain. But across the board, of those 300 patients, almost 40% of them met criteria for, uh, for depression. Very common. And the graph here shows that even in, in patients, and the y-axis here is depressive symptoms, even in patients who have inactive Crohn's disease, which is the bar on the left, 30% of them have depressive symptoms. And if they have Crohn's plus, plus pain, whether it's active disease pain or uh, functional abdominal pain, either way, they have even more depressive symptoms. So this is a, a huge problem. 25 to 40% of children with IBD have symptoms of depression or anxiety, according to several different studies. Um, and the predictors of depression and anxiety are many. Um, if they have more severe disease, if they, in older kids, so this is adolescents, if they have active pain, uh, fatigue, if they're on steroid therapy, um, and other stressful life events, including maternal depression and family dysfunction, which certainly is a common problem too. Okay, so we know this is a problem. We know there are many things that contribute to poor quality of life. How do you improve quality of life? You can't improve it if you can't measure it, or at least some of the sages suggest that. Um, so how do you measure quality of life? There are a number of different instruments and validated tools that are out there. There's a growing list of them all the time. Uh, some of them are quite cumbersome. Some of them are, are shorter. I'm not going to get into the gory details of the statistics behind any, one, any of them. We don't have time for that, but just an overview. So some of them are disease-specific, specific to IBD, and some of them are generic, non-disease-specific, but general quality of life instruments. The, IMPACT-3 is a well-validated and well-studied uh, quality of life instrument for uh, inflammatory bowel disease, and the SF-36 is one for uh, uh, generic uh, quality of life instruments. These are excellent tools, but they're long. They have over 30 questions each. The PEDS-QL is the Pediatric Quality of Life Inventory. Uh, it is not disease-specific, but it's a very good uh, instrument for uh, measuring quality of life in pediatric patients. A little better, 23 questions. But I want to um, talk about the, the PROMISE measures, and I'll come back to the others because the visual analog scales are also important. But PROMISE it stands for Patient Reported Outcome Measurement Information System. Um, this is a series of surveys that, that was br brought up yesterday and in a couple of other meetings. Um, these are measures of patient reported outcomes, or PRO, and they measure various different aspects of quality of life, and, and, and very specific, uh, such as pain, or pain interference with activity, fatigue interfering with activity. It's been uh, studied across a wide range of chronic conditions, and it's been validated in different age groups down to age eight. And the nice thing about it is it's short. There are 10 questions each, the Likert scale, very easy to fill out. Um, so this is one thing that might be used. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, sorry. Uh, the other thing uh, uh, that is even shorter is a visual analog scale. This is a study that we did looking at uh, MR enterography and inflammation and how that relates to quality of life. And we used a visual analog scale. And uh, this is a, a slider with uh, uh, text at each end anchoring uh, worst possible health, 
best possible health and asking the child, or in this case we did both child and parent, to rate how the child, uh, child's quality of life is. It's a very simple thing. It doesn't obviously get into any details, but when we looked at the visual analog scale, comparing inflammation on MR enterography with this visual analog scale, it, it compared very nicely. And it was even sensitive to change that as the kids get better, this is a, a study where we did serial MRs looking for change. As the kids' inflammation got better, their quality of life improved as well. And this is another version of this. This was done by Corey Siegel's group, which is a feelings thermometer. And uh, well, at least we in the room know, remember what real thermometers look like. Um, and the parents do too. But I think this is a very nice tool that also can be used. Very simple, very easy to do. And uh, Corey showed very nicely on the y-axis what's called burden of symptoms here is that feelings thermometer measure. And comparing with the short IBD quality of life index, showing that it correlates very nicely. So it's, it, it seems like it's a, a pretty good quick tool for assessing quality of life. Okay, so for the sake of discussion, let's say we're measuring quality of life in all of our patients and we have that both to assess them at baseline and to follow. What are we gonna do about this? To start off, I wanna talk about improving quality of life separate from improving disease activity because the two do not necessarily go together. And we talked a little bit about this yesterday and we've probably all seen this study that made the cover of uh, clinical gastro and hepatology. Um, this was a study of 21 adult patients with active Crohn's disease who were recruited uh, and they were randomized to either smoking cannabis or smoking placebo. We can argue about the blinding of the study but it was a randomized study. Uh, <laughs> And as you can imagine, and their outcome measure that they looked at was Crohn's Disease Activity Index, which largely represents symptoms, which largely represents quality of life. And as we, we can imagine, the, the, the group that smoked cannabis, 90% of them had an improvement in their CDAI, meaning they had an improvement of their, their symptoms, where uh, the placebo group, a much smaller group, uh, had an improvement of their symptoms. But importantly, all the measures of disease activity, the, active measure, the, um, the objective measures that they had, hemoglobin, hematocrit, CRP, liver enzymes, kidney function, all of those measures showed no change. Uh, and as Dr. Kim, I think, pointed out yesterday, the, once they stopped the study, these, uh, the symptoms returned back to, to, to their previous baseline. Oh, no, uh, oh, somebody mentioned this yesterday, I thought so, I think. Um, anyway, uh, so we can improve quality of life without improving the disease. This was another study uh, that looked at cannabis use, and this was a survey that uh, um, surveyed 300 patients with IBD. 18% of them used cannabis to relieve their symptoms. I thought it was interesting that half of those patients said that cannabis worked at least as well as or perhaps better than steroids for their symptoms. Now, cannabis use over six months was a strong predictor of surgery for Crohn's disease with an odds ratio of, of five, so five-fold increased risk of surgery. So, you, again, can improve disease, I'm sorry, can improve symptoms, can improve quality of life and without improving disease and perhaps the disease will even get worse. So we have to really take both into consideration. And we have to can take all the reasons for poor quality of life into consideration, occult disease, pain, IBS, fatigue, depression, anxiety, uh, embarrassment, social stigma, and other stressors including family dynamics and school. These are all important and all play into patients' quality of life. Um, NAS began put out a, a very nice um, uh, report on psychosocial issues in pediatric IBD patients uh, led by Laura Magner. Um, and this is a table that I modified and took from that report. And I added at the top disease activity because, of course, we need to make sure that's under control. But all these other issues are very important, and this is a reminder to all of us to pay attention um, in general. Short-term stressors, including a new diagnosis or new flare of disease, can cause uh, psychosocial stress, can cause adjustment disorders, can cause transient depression. These things are a normal reaction to, to, to stress. However, sometimes they rise to the level where they really interfere with life and they can get to be extraordinarily troublesome. And it's important for us to remember to refer the, uh, these families to mental health uh, if, if this rises to that level. Um, there are, of course, these tools that can be used to identify patients with uh, uh, poor quality of life, and there are others that are specific to psychopathology. Um, and it's also important to, to remember that cognitive behavioral therapy is very effective, and it can help with a lot of the, 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 the manifestations of poor quality of life, uh, other than the disease itself. Uh, oh, that's a different discussion. Um, and these kids will need frequent follow-up, and it's important to have 
somebody in your pocket who is uh, trained at and skilled at cognitive behavioral fit therapy because they can be extraordinarily helpful. And some of these kids can also benefit from a psychiatrist as well. Now, um, I mentioned the different tools for screening uh, quality of life. Uh, and the nice thing about these is they are uh, large, they're filled out by the patient or the parent. And this is a patient report, which is helpful because the busy clinicians often don't probe into these questions and often miss when kids aren't feeling well that it, it might be uh, that there's some underlying psychopathology or other things going on. Um, so those are helpful, helpful tools. And then it's always important to remember the, the, all, uh, to address all the different social, uh, all the different domains, including the social aspects. Um, cognitive behavioral therapy can help improve social functioning in kids. And there are many support groups, such as uh, Camp Oasis that we were hearing about this morning, uh, that is an excellent resource to our families, but also support groups. And, and, and in, in some places, there are these peer mentoring uh, groups as well, which are, are very helpful to, to patients. And then. Family coping, family dynamics are important, and school as well uh, can both be a stressor to the child and the disease can interfere with school uh, performance. So 504 plans uh, can be helpful and we should use them when, when they will help the patient. Um, oh, I don't want to forget, I put this as a reminder, there is some relationship between vitamin D and quality of life, which uh, we can get into the, the mechanism or the causality, but it's easy to check, it's easy to treat. Uh, if it's low, and we should remember to at least consider this as well. Now, implications. Um, children with poor quality of life uh, have a higher rate of poor uh, school functioning, and kids with IBD in general um, are at risk of poor school functioning due to increased absences from school. They, uh, in some studies, have lower grade point averages, and but this is particularly a problem for kids who have psychosocial issues. Now. Overall, kids with IBD do as well in school as kids without IBD. However, there's a subset that don't. And some independent predictors of, uh, uh, of worse outcome in school are low, lower socioeconomic status, which has been shown across all populations, different diseases. That's not specific to IBD. But a diagnosis with a mental health problem also has been associated with poor school function. And this is important um, for the long term. We also I referred to this briefly earlier. We did this study of college adjustment. Now. The universities and colleges across the country use this survey called the SACQ, this Student Adjustment to College Questionnaire, which uh, is highly predictive of graduation rates, and the colleges use this to predict uh, graduation rates. And we did a study of college students in Michigan looking at their IBD-related quality of life and how it associated with this adjustment to college survey. And as you can imagine, those who had better quality of life adjusted to college better. Those who had poor quality of life adjusted to college worse, but this was just Michigan. So we repeated this in a, a national survey and found basically the same thing. And this is important because if you have poor IBD-related quality of life, and if you then adjust poorly to college and have lower graduation rates or lower success rates in college, that has lifelong implications in terms of jobs, ability to get into grad school or medical school, uh, and insurability. So it's important a reminder that we should all make sure that our kids are tuned up before they go to college, but uh, quality of life has long-term implications, not just in terms of how kids are feeling in the here and now. Um, so, summary. It's important for us, of course, and this is what we largely focus on, it's important for us to treat the disease, including occult disease, and make sure that we know how the disease is doing, that we're addressing all aspects of inflammation uh, and stricturing. And it's important to identify which of our patients have irritable bowel syndrome, because IBS is extraordinarily common. Um, and if they have IBD, IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, then we need to treat the irritable bowel syndrome. But it's important not to forget, IBS may also be a, uh, a signal of occult disease, so don't forget that as well. And then if there is fatigue, figure out why they're fatigued if you can, treat, send for treatment of their depression. I didn't mention this earlier, but one of the things that contribute to, to fatigue is sleep disorders, which are, there's an increased incidence in IBD patients, so we should consider that as well. And again, consider occult disease activity as contributing to fatigue. Um, and then remember to assess mental health. Um, consider depression and anxiety, as these are uh, big contributors to mental health and to quality of life in general. And we have to take all of this into, into, uh, into context, context of the child, context of the family dynamics, context of school, context of life in general. Um, and again, not forget about depression and anxiety that are uh, big contributors to quality of life. And if there is depression and anxiety, we have to refer for treatment. But while we're treating for depression and anxiety, we also shouldn't forget to treat the disease as well, including the occult disease. So 
that concludes. Uh, I'll stick around later, but thank you.